do of those who try to propose reform efforts. In fact, my concern is now shifted to how the LBPOA will seek to undermine the re reform proposals that will come out of this process through their lobbying apparatus. Since the city got the handpicked as consultants, it would be nice to hear on the record from the city and this committee that they will not seek to undermine any recommendations that come out of this process. Thank you for hearing me and thank you for allowing me to speak. That's all. That concludes thank public you. comment. Thank you for the comment. I uh, would like to just share that, you know, in the first public safety committee of this year of 2021 in April, I was sure that, you know, um, interest amongst our uh, committee here in, in, in learning more about how the CPCC works and, and off of getting another update about our consultants. So I'd like uh, Patrick Withers, Mr. Patrick Withers to provide a presentation on this item. I also want to congratulate him on um, the arrival of his new child. So I just want to make sure um, to congratulate him on that. <laughs> Mr. Withers. All right, thank you very much, Councilwoman. I, I absolutely appreciate that. Thank you. Um, so good afternoon, uh, honorable, honorable members of the City Council. Um, so we'll be conducting a presentation this afternoon on the CPCC investigation process and giving you a update on the uh, evaluation uh, services for the CPCC. So first I will give a breakdown of uh, the current CPCC staff. Um, so we currently have three FTEs. There is myself, uh, the manager of the CPCC. We have one full-time investigator, one part-time investigator, and then we share admin support with the government affairs, uh, the government, government affairs assistant. Um, just recently this year, we started a CPCC intern program. So now we have CPCC interns as well, um, who insist us with investigations such as uh, uh, summarizing interviews, reviewing body worn camera video, um, and things of that nature. So annually, uh, the CPCC uh, receives cases around 180 to, two, to 200 cases annually. Um, the commission reviews uh, around 170 to 270 cases annually as well. Now to go into the actual complaint process. So CPCC staff investigates external complaints with allegations of police misconduct of the Long Beach Police Department employees. Complaints can be filed either directly with the CPCC or with the Long Beach Police Department. And there are two concurrent investigations that take place with every complaint filed. Uh, which are the CPCC investigation and the Long Beach Police Department internal affairs investigation. And so there are several ways uh, citizens could file a complaint um, uh, a police of police misconduct with the CPCC. So um, complaints could file or the public can file in person, um, of course, pre-COVID and everything, uh, you know, that was uh, an option. Um, and then hopefully we'll be getting back to that soon um, by phone, email or uh, by mail. And so all citizen complaints filed directly with the CPCC are sent to the Long Beach Police Department Internal Affairs as well for them to conduct their investigation also. So these are, uh, so kind of going into complaints filed directly with the Long Beach Police Department. So these are citizen complaints that are filed directly through the LBPD um, and, and Internal Affairs investigates them. So in turn, Internal Affairs, Internal Affairs sends Internal Affairs sends every citizen complaint filed uh, with the Long Beach Police Department to the CPCC for investigation as well. And so after that, both Internal Affairs and the CPCC investigate all citizen complaints filed uh, alleging police misconduct. All right, so let's go into case creation after we receive the complaint. So. Um, upon receipt of a citizen complaint, a case is created in the CPCC's case management system and is then assigned a case number. Uh, then all, in the, in the, all initial evidence documentation, complaint information, witness information, and accused officer information provided by the complainant is linked to the case file and case management system. An acknowledgement letter is then sent to the complainant um, after we upload everything into our case management system and have a case number. And CPCC staff sends a subpoena to Tecum to the Long Beach Police Department Internal Affairs requesting uh, full and complete documents and evidence, including all attachments, supplemental reports, photos, audio and video recordings, and compelled statements related to a case. 
They'll an actual investigation. CPCC investigators will contact complainants to interview them. Uh, investigators will gather witness information, if any, um, if there are any witnesses in a particular case and any evidence the complainant uh, may have regarding the incident they were involved in. Uh, CPCC investigators, uh, you know, go in the field as necessary to obtain um, evidence, such as if there's surveillance footage, uh, maybe canvassing a certain area to uh, try to find witnesses for, uh, you know, a certain incident that occurred as well. Um, CPCC receives requested uh, files um, from internal affairs, such as body-worn camera footage uh, and compelled statements. Um, and then, you know, once that's received, we review that stuff and um, then uh, the final case brief is prepared for the commission's review. So to get into um, uh, a little bit of state law here, um, so the California Law Enforcement Telecommunication System, or CLETS, um, so this is uh, basically a database um, that where you could pull files such as DMV records, um, uh, warrant history, criminal history, things of that nature. And so uh, per state law, um, you know, CPCC staff uh, uh, and CPCC commissioners, we can't have access to this particular system. Um, and we also can't review uh, these particular um, documents as well. Um, this is not only something, a problem here in Long Beach, but this is actually a problem just statewide. Um, you know, I've talked to several directors of other oversight entities around the state, and, uh, you know, just per the state law, uh, none of them could have access to uh, CLETS as well. So it's definitely something that's um, disrupting uh, investigations statewide um, when it comes to oversight. So just to get a little bit of uh, digging a little bit into um, some of the law itself. Uh, so according to the California Department of Justice, Office of Attorney General, um, the CLETS policies, practices, and procedures, uh, section 1.6.4, confidentiality of information from the CLETS, only authorized law enforcement, criminal justice personnel, or their law authorized designees may use, CLETS, may use a CLETS terminal. Any information from the CLETS is confidential and for official use only. Access is defined as the ability to hear or view any information provided through the CLETS. It is required that each employee or volunteer sign an employee statement form prior to operating or having access to the CLETS terminals, equipment, or information. This, inf this form addresses confidentiality, release, and misuse of information for the, from the CLETS. Information from the CLETS is on a right-to-know and need-to-know basis. Authorized personnel shall not inquire into their own record or have someone inquire for them and accessing and or releasing information from the CLETS for non-law enforcement purposes is prohibited unless otherwise mandated and is subject to administrative action and or criminal prosecution. So once the commission uh, uh, reviews cases in the commission meetings, um, uh, they basically make findings recommendations from there. So commissioners deliberate over cases in closed session and make a finding recommendation and so finding recommendations are made solely on an act or remission that, if true, violates Long Beach Police Department policy or training. Commissioners must make an objective, systematic, um, good faith determination of credibility based on reasonably thorough investigation and the information available at the time. Commissioners can send recommendations uh, and or concerns regarding the particular incident to the city manager and the Long Beach Police Department. Um, such things would be uh, Long Beach Police Department policy recommendations, concerns about an officer's actions in a particular incident, or discipline recommendations for a certain officer. Uh, commissioners can have uh, can subpoena additional evidence from the Long Beach Police Department um, as well, and commissioners can vote to have a hearing also. So just to get into um, the definitions of uh, the findings um, that can be determined for a case, so. Um, the commission could recommend and the city manager could, could find a final finding of uh, sustained, uh, which is basically the investigation indicates the alleged act more than likely did not occur um, and constitutes misconduct. Uh, this finding recommends discipline for the accused and discipline can be a, a letter of recommends, reprimand, suspension, demotion, or termination. Um, there could be a finding of other, which is the alleged act, although more than likely than not occurred was not misconduct and could be most appropriately handled by training or other means. Exonerated, um, which is defined as the investigation indicates the alleged act did occur, but the actions taken place were lawful, proper, and justified. Unfounded, which is the investigation indicates the alleged act did not occur. An example of that would be that 
there's no information or evidence that supports the allegation, or there is evidence that the, that the alleged act did not occur, or the individual name of the complaint was not involved. Uh, receive and file is another option as well. Um, the information received is submitted past the statute of limitations for disciplinary actions, or the information received is not on its face established misconduct. A case may be reopened and further information or evidence is submitted within the statute of limitation period. There's not sustained. The investigation fails to disclose sufficient evidence to prove the alleged act. And lastly, there is reinvestigate, um, which is when new information comes to the attention of the to the attention of the commission, or when the commission requests clarification or additional information that could reasonably be obtained. So after the commission makes their finding recommendation, <clears throat> those recommendations will be reviewed by the deputy city manager. Um, the deputy city manager will then look at the CPC and the CPCC investigation, the CPC's commissioner's deliberation, uh, and the commissioner's recommended finding and the outcome of the internal affairs investigation as well. The deputy city manager will then recommend the final finding to the city manager after review of everything above, and the city manager then makes the final decision or the final finding. Once the final finding is made, uh, final findings letters are mailed or emailed to the complainants uh, containing the final findings of their case, and also final finding letters are sent to the accused officers advising them of the final findings made against them. And that concludes the presentation on the uh, CPCC investigation process. And so now um, I will go into an overview of the CPCC evaluation update. So on May 24th um, of this year, uh, we had the kickoff meeting, um, uh, which was conducted with uh, the city staff and the Polish change integration team. Um, and then the project work plan was uh, finalized as well um, in uh, June of uh, this year. And so the status of the evaluation works. So the Polish change integration team um, so far, <clears throat> they have uh, been introduced in public open session during the June 10th, 2021 uh, CPCC meeting. And they observed both the open and closed sessions of the June and July 2021 CPCC meetings. Um, they have conducted document review and legal research, uh, which began um, in June, 2021. And then uh, they have also been conducting internal and external stakeholder interviews um, and and will be continuing uh, from this month, July, throughout August. And then so um, next month in August, uh, it is planned to conduct an in-person and virtual public listening sessions um, uh, during that month. And that concludes the presentation. Thank you, Mr. Withers, uh, for this presentation. Um, I'll, I'll go to my colleagues, um, Vice Chair uh, Price or uh, Councilmember Uranga, if you guys have any questions or comments. Um, thank you, Chair Saro. I do, I have a couple of questions. Um, first, uh, and thank you very much for the presentation. I think the, the, just the background of the way the commission is set up currently is very helpful for me. Um, and so I appreciate that. The one question I had is how often are the recommendations that are made by the CPCC accepted or carried out by the city manager? Do we have that data? Yeah, Councilwoman Price, uh, this is Kevin Jackson. Hey, we, uh, we don't have the, the data right in front of us. Um, we do have the annual reports posted online. Um, I will tell you that uh, most of the recommendations that come from the commission um, are supported by the city manager. Uh, so the, in a minority of the cases, um, there is you know, a, difference, uh, a different finding than what the commission is recommending. Okay, and so when the commission, uh, and thank you for that, it, when the commission is making a recommendation, um, is there anyone that kind of leads their um, recommendation? Like, is there a staff person that kind of shepherds them through the process and makes an, an initial recommendation? Uh, I'm not sure exactly how it's set up when they go into closed session. Like, is it like a jury and there's a four person that kind of leads the discussions or is it like council closed session where sometimes we'll have a staff member there um, or the city attorney that can help provide some technical expertise. Yeah, so the staff role is, um, 
is purely objective and related to uh, providing uh, the uh, objective, the result of the objective uh, investigations in the form of a brief. And so those briefs are shared with the, uh, the commission members. They, the chairperson uh, leads the discussions amongst the, uh, the commissioners in the closed session um, uh, deliberations uh, of the briefs, the investigative briefs. Present in those closed sessions are um, the um, IA commander, we have the investigators, the CPCC manager, Patrick uh, Withers, is there to help facilitate and respond to any technical questions relating to the process. Uh, and then, of course, um, the IA commander is present to respond to any uh, uh, technical questions related to the IA process in, in any of the cases that are under consideration. And um, and then, as you know, I, I, I am actually, we have our city attorney's office that's represented uh, in the closed sessions as well to provide uh, any legal advice that might be necessary. So they tend to operate kind of like our, our city council closed sessions, um, like you suggested. And then a deputy city manager, I, I actually sit in on all of these meetings uh, and observe them. Um, it um, really gives me an opportunity to uh, understand the commission's perspectives, um, you know, and then before I even have an opportunity to, to you know, to, to, um, to listen to uh, what the outcomes of the IA process. Um, so I get the briefings directly from the manager of the CPCC, but being in a room is, is very helpful. So I'm, I'm at all of the meetings. Okay, that's that's good to know. So my question would be, since the commission makes the recommendations to the city manager, is there a process in place where the members of the commission and or city staff who are part of those closed session meetings are walled off from the city manager who would be making the final decision on what follow up action to implement? To me, it seems like there would be perhaps not a legal conflict, but a little bit of a concern if there's some bleed over between the two processes. If that makes sense. Yeah. yeah. See if I understand it completely. When you refer to the two processes, are you talking about the CPCC process as well as the IA process? The, so the IA, there's an IA investigation that's happening concurrently with the CPCC um, value um, investigation, and then the outcome of both are considered by the city manager. Um, so the recommendation, right. right. So who, so, so is this, I guess my question is, is the city manager's consideration of the recommendations separate and apart from what the CPCC discussions have been or deliberations have been? I, I would say yes, yes. Okay, right, so, because if you think about it in terms of due process, there's, well, the way I'm thinking about it, and it could be wrong, there's different levels, right? So the city manager really needs to be taking into consideration the recommendations and the findings and making an objective determination without the cloud of a, a subjective interpretation by someone who may have been present for the deliberations, if that makes sense. And I'm assuming he does that. Yes. Yes. Okay. Okay. Thank you. I don't have any additional questions. Thank you. Councilman Duranga, do you okay, have? Thank you. Couldn't hear you. Um, could we go back to the presentation uh, right at the beginning where you have the staff broken up uh, there? I'd like to refer to that right now. Is it possible to go back? Yeah. Can we yeah. can we pull up the presentation? Thank you. I'll go to the first page. Or the second. Okay, next page. That one, okay. So when I see this uh, organizational graph here, you have, uh, you say full-time investigator, is there only one? Uh, this is uh, Patrick, yes, that's correct. There's only one full-time investigator. And one part-time investigator? That's correct. 
and then you have CPCC interns. Yes, that's um, correct. And yeah, that was just uh, started this year. Okay, about how many interns do you think? So uh, our first cohort of interns, we had three, and currently uh, for the summer internship, we have two. Okay. Now, in, in regards to the full-time and part-time investigators, are they sworn personnel? Are they retired? What's their status? Yeah, neither of them are a sworn personnel or, or retired law enforcement at all. So they're civilians? Uh, yes, that's correct. But do they have any like law enforcement background? Um, they have investigative background, uh, but not necessarily uh, law enforcement background. Oh my gosh, okay. the person is. So what? when we're looking at these investigators, uh, are they like, do they receive uh, post training on investigations or any kind of a formalized training on how to conduct investigations in law enforcement? Privatized. Yeah, so our, our currently our full time investigator, um, he used to uh, uh, investigate matters with the Orange County Public Defender's Office. Um, so he's had some experience there, um, as well as uh, with other uh, post post stuff with like accident investigations and things of that nature. Um, and so uh, he's also um, a part of a uh, use of force. Um, which is the National Association of uh, Civilian, Law, Civilian Oversight and Law Enforcement. And so he's a part of their, um, their use of force committee body as well, um, where they are currently working on uh, standards for use of force, um, basically nationwide for, for departments. Um, and currently our, our part-time investigator, um, he has several years of experience in, in private investigation. Okay, now the, uh, the interns. Are they receiving uh, training on investigative skills or are they required to be uh, participants in some kind of formalized law enforcement uh, uh, enrollment program, uh, AJCJ class, administration of justice or criminal justice? Yeah, so yeah. Um, they're definitely all college students um, uh, and you know, whether it be taking uh, classes in criminal justice or uh, um, uh, public affairs or um, anything of that nature. Uh, and so, um, you know, they've basically taken those classes and uh, they're, they're getting a lot of investigative experience through our internship. Um, like I said, just kind of helping us with some investigations. Uh, you know, they sit in on some interviews. Um, they help us summarize interviews uh, for the briefs. Um, they help us review body worn camera footage um, and any other uh, particular documents and evidence and putting everything together uh, for these briefs. Okay, so is there a uh, career ladder for these interns? I mean, once they finish their internship, or well, maybe I'll go back uh, a little bit. How long are the internships? Uh, a year, two years, six months? Yeah, so it's uh, yeah. per per semester. So they're uh, throughout the throughout a semester. Okay, just so one semester, and then they, they uh, you bring in another one. That's correct. Okay. All right. And your CPCC government affairs assistant, is that like a clerical help? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Help you fill out the reports and put the documents together and present them, that type of thing? Uh, that's, that's correct. Yeah. And it's more like uploading uh, documents into our case management system and kind of helping with those tasks and, uh, you know, helping create the letters and um, uh, that go to complainants and, and officers and uh, things of that nature. Okay. So once a, um, an officer receives a uh, complaint and the uh, CPCC uh, opens an investigation, conducts the investigation, comes back with a recommendation, uh, whether it's upheld or thrown out, exonerated. Is, how long does that uh, report stay on a, on a police department uh, employee's file? Do you hear my question? Yeah, I, I yeah. believe it might be seven years. I'm not 100% sure, um, but I, I believe it might be seven years. Okay. And so when an officer receives another complaint, is it cumulative? Is it, is it, uh, is each case 
filed independently of the other, or is there a, a, an opportunity to look at these cases as a, a cumulative uh, uh, behavior pattern for, for an officer that, that might add to, uh, to another investigation in regards to the number of the, the uh, opportunity, well, not the opportunity, but the, uh, the uh, placement of, a, of an employee on probation or uh, discipline? Yeah, from a CPCC yeah. standpoint, um, you know, every case is independent from the other. But do they have an accumulative effect on an on individual's file? Yeah, I can see. Meaning, and, yeah, uh, count, an count. officer gets discipline for excessive use of force, exonerated. There's another case that comes back later let's say a year, two years down the line, another police complaint of uh, uh, excessive use of force again, uh, exonerated, and then a third time, maybe four or five years later, it's a 10 year pattern. Uh, with that, with those previous two complaints uh, serve as uh, evidence of, uh, of a pattern of behavior? So from a, a CPCC standpoint, um, the commissioners, they, they do recognize, uh, say if they see a name more than once, sometimes they do recognize that um, and, and they will take that into consideration um, as well, uh, you know, when, when making their, their finding recommendations. Um, yeah, so that's, I, I'd say from a CC, CPCC standpoint, um, you know, that's, that's probably it with that. Okay, is there an opportunity for an officer to request that a file be closed or cleared? Yeah, Council Member Uringa, uh, it's Kevin. I don't know if we have someone from the police department here that could probably better answer that question because uh, that would be, uh, that. I think that question would relate to their personnel file. Um, that would be more of an HR question. Yeah, I think somebody, if we had someone from the leadership from the police department on the call tonight, today, uh, they probably, if, if Wally were here, I'm not sure if he's here today, but um, he could probably answer that question as well. Um, I'm but, here. I'm online, Kevin. Okay. With, uh, okay, great. Assistant Chief Heaters, uh, Member Uranga, if you have a question for me, happy to answer. Yeah, I was asking in terms of a police officer ability, police officer's ability to have his file cleared if uh, if uh, he found that he wanted to go somewhere else, let's say, uh, found a job at uh, another police department and would not like to have his file exposed, would he be able to close his file or clear it? No, an officer doesn't have the ability to remove discipline from a personnel file, file and uh, likely going to other jobs, you're required to uh, sign a waiver. Uh, so the background investigator can access your, your file from the previous position you have. There's a retention policy in place for records, but uh, an officer cannot remove disciplinary records from their file. Yeah, and that was going to be my next question. Is, a, uh, is there a uh, uh, limita uh, statute of limitations or whatever for uh, keeping these uh, items on file in the personnel file? It depends on the, the case council member. It depends on the nature of the investigation or, or the, uh, the allegations. Uh, typically, um, discipline uh, involving less than, than 10 days um, is uh, uh, submitted for destruction at the five year mark. Um, anything over that is there, there's no, the retention is, is ongoing. There's no destruction of that uh, or removal of that. Um, some cases, based on the nature of the case, uh, even if they are, under 10 days are still kept uh, depending on um, the position of the chief of police. Okay, so you have an internal method of review, whether it's uh, uh, an egregious, an egregious uh, type of a of complaint or one that is uh, minor, and that's by uh, virtue of the uh, discipline that is doled out? Yeah, yeah, all of that is taken into consideration and it's also associated with, with law and any destruction of records goes before council. So uh, for um, disciplinary records that, that have reached the five year mark and are uh, meet the criteria for that, they'll go before council for evidence destruction. Okay. Now, when there's discipline pending or there is, or there is discipline, 
Uh, normally, I, I, I would venture to say that the officer has a, an opportunity to appeal that to the Civil Service Commission. Yes, uh, if it is a uh, letter of reprimand, the appeal goes through the police department uh, and then to the city manager's office. If it is anything above a letter of reprimand, they can uh, appeal to the Civil Service Commission. Okay, or you can just accept the letter of reprimand and leave it go at that, right? Yes, sir. They can accept any discipline and choose not to appeal. All right, that's all I have, uh, Chair. Thank you. Thank you, Council Member Yuranga, for your question. I also wanted to follow from your question about um, just the number of investigator is, you know, you shared at our last meeting that, you know, it does take some time and also staff staffing to, to investigate um, each complaint made, right, with the CC. Having an independent complaint being reviewed by an investigator does take time. So I'm just wondering if Mr. Wither can share um, with the new fiscal year 22 22, uh, excuse me, fiscal year 22 uh, budget, how will CPC be affected by it? Chairperson Saro, this is, this is Kevin. Um, so we do have, so with the adoption of the FY21 budget, um, we uh, recommended and council approved a um, $150,000 on a recurring basis to support um, the work of the CPCC with the initial priority being that we would use uh, in the first year, $150,000 to, uh, to do the independent evaluation, which, we're, which is underway now, of course. And so, and then the thought was going forward that, um, the $150,000 would support implementation of any of the recommendations that might have a cost to them uh, at the end of the study. So, i.e. staffing costs. So for FY22, um, the, the $150,000 is, is in the proposed uh, budget uh, to support uh, you know, any um, recommendations that uh, will come from the study and uh, most likely that would be uh, to support uh, any staffing recommendations. Great, thank you so much. Mm -hmm. uh, I have a few uh, other questions that I wanted to make sure, having been on the CPCC, I wanna make sure we also just follow up on a few information Mr. Withers share is, how, how is the finding uh, Mr. Wither share, how is the finding um, of each case shared to the public? And as well as to the complainant as well. Uh, yes, so the findings uh, themselves, so they aren't shared with the public, but um, as far as being shared with the complainant, um, once a final finding is made by the city manager, um, then basically the only people that will receive um, uh, what the outcome of those of the findings are, are um, the complainant and the, and the accused officers. So, um, the complaint will receive a letter. Um, you know, we, we mail them out to them most of the time, or if they submitted their complaint via email, and they didn't want to provide their address, um, then we'll email uh, the findings letter to them. And then uh, also um, each accused officer is uh, basically sent a letter um, with the final findings for uh, their case as well. I guess I should clarify my question is how does the CPCC uh, report back on their closed session uh, on, on their, their um, I guess, decision for each case? Yeah, so uh, it would be, so there's a second open session um, after uh, each, um, after each closed session. And so mm -hmm. the chair will then come out and basically read off the tallies for each allegation, the voting tallies for uh, um, each allegation that was voted on. And so they won't specifically say what the findings were, but they'll basically say, for example, read off uh, the commission voted, uh, let's say, um, you know, six to five uh, for allegation number one of unbecoming conduct for CPCC, CPCC case number and whatever the case number may be. So they'll read it off that way. Um, but you know they won't say what the actual findings were. But um, another way that we 
do put those statistics out there is through our annual reports on exactly um, you know what the uh, the number of finding recommendations and the number of final findings uh, that there were. And I'm just going to further ask this question is why why is it reported that way? You know, why are the findings not shared? The, the you know the 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 vote that's made on the finding why is that not shared to the public yeah so um that's more of a confidentiality thing because uh those findings are a part of the officer's personnel file um, which are protected of course um you know by law and so uh that's the main reason why um, those findings aren't shared because um you know in the end uh all that stuff is a part of the officer's personnel file mm -hmm. Okay, thank you for sharing that. And one more question about um, the off just to follow up on the officer's file is when in each case that the CPCC investigator, um, you know, put together kind of a package for the commissioners to review, are there any instance where the police officer's personnel file or that complaints, any previous complaint about them has been made? Is that included in the file for the commissioners to review? Why? Uh, so, yes. So that's my question. Yeah. So uh, recently we implemented um, and this was at the uh, request of the commissioners. Um, we basically implemented uh, a thing where we include um, how many sustained or other recommendations the commission made on an officer previously. Um, but that's only as it relates to the allegation um, that that's basically on that case that they're reviewing. So say if an officer had um an allegation of uh you know failure to take a report um and and they say they rendered sustained or made a, a sustained recommendation for that in the past um but the allegation that's forward to them say for that they're reviewing at the time is for like a use of force allegation um then we aren't going to put uh, that sustained finding for that um for that failure to take report on there but we'll put if there were previous use of force um sustain recommendations that they made or other recommendations, then we'll include that. Um, so that way they'll see that they made, uh, you know, a particular sustained or, or other recommendation for a similar finding that they're reviewing or similar allegation that they're reviewing. Great. Thank you so much. Just one last thing. It's really regarding the CPC evaluation is I saw in your slide that there's going to be a virtual listening session in August, 2021. I wanted to, I don't know if you have, how is that going to look? Because I know that, you know, we had a pretty robust process in getting feedback and, and how uh, we're at this process of the redesign phase. I'm wondering, is one month enough for a listening session? And how often, is there only going to be one in August? How, how does that look? Yeah, Chair, Chair Saro, it's, it's Kevin. So, uh, what the contract calls for with uh, the Polis change integration is two. So two uh, public listening sessions, and we've asked them to do one in person and commit to doing one virtually. And so um, right now we have um, a tentative schedule for those to occur, I think one week apart at the end of August. And so probably within, uh, I would say, we're, we're, we're meeting with them on Monday. So I think uh, probably next week sometime we'll be in a position to publish those dates uh, so we're just wrapping up the final plans for uh, what's going to actually happen in those uh, listing sessions and how we're going to promote them and uh, get, you know, encourage people to attend. Great. Thanks for that, Mr. Jackson. And I, I believe that concludes my questions on this item and would like to, uh, uh, commissioners to please vote to receive the presentation on the CPCC as well as the update on the consultant. Uh, Mr. Clark, you go. Yes. Councilmember Yuranga? Aye. Vice Chair Price? Aye. Chair Saro? Aye. Motion carries. Thank you. And can you, uh, Mr. Clark, can you please read the next item? Recommendation to receive a presentation from the Police Department on privacy considerations and best practices associated with the use of the Los Angeles County Regional Identification System Facial Recognition System. Can I get a motion on this item? Motion to receive a file. Second. Thank you. Uh, and before I, I ask Ms. 
um, Assistant Chief Habish to present. Uh, I'd like to hear public comments on this item. So to start public comment, Greg Buell, please unmute yourself and your time will begin when you begin speaking. Okay, um, I'd been told I was gonna go after the presentation, but I guess I'll go before. It's kind of hard to speak on a presentation you haven't seen, but here it goes. Um, so my name's Greg Buell, as I said before, I'm with Czech LBB, LBPD, a local police transparency project that filed the Public, Record, Rex Acre, the Public Records Act request that uncovered the Long Beach Police Department's facial recognition program. This is a really complicated topic to cover in three minutes, so I've submitted a letter to the clerk with much of the information I'm gonna to try to cover in my time. For over the last decade, the Long, the Long Beach Police Department was more concerned with secrecy than with best practices. They misled Public Records Act requesters and the media about their facial recognition program for years, and they had never been transparent with this committee for the last decade. Now that transparency has been forced upon them, they have adopted a facial recognition program that is as close to best practices as the Queen Mary is the seaworthy. It is particularly concerning that the department has chosen to ignore specific best practices that others have developed to reduce racial bias. I know this because I've seen the special order that, that they rushed out right after I uncovered their program. It's attached to the letter I submitted to you. You can see they drafted it on November 1st, 2020, and it's still not up on the SB 978 page, even though it was signed in March by Chief Luna. They've adopted the policy that mirrors the Detroit, uh, uh, that mirrors uh, facial recognition program policies that have proven to be inadequate time and time again. It mirrors the, the program, the policy the Detroit Police Department recently replaced after it proved inadequate to protect the civil liberties and constitutional rights of those misidentified. My letter describes many of the best practices that LBPD has ignored. I'll go through as many as I can before my time runs out. The new special order has no procedures for removing the wrongfully arrested from permanent inclusion in the LockRest database. From what I've been able to find out, the only way to get yourself removed from this database is to hire a good private lawyer and get a court order for your removal. It's a major equity issue because many wrongful, wrongfully arrested people can't afford a private lawyer. The policy has no limit on submitting poor quality images, which are more likely to lead to misidentification. Mis the LBPD has reserved the right to use live facial recognition on city-owned surveillance cameras. Live video analytics is such a bad idea it could easily get someone killed. This is because the technology is not capable of producing consistent and accurate mass matches. That's why you need a human reviewer. Um, imagine the chaos when the LBPD starts getting alerts saying a suspect was spotted by a camera downtown, but nine out of 10 times they're being sent out on a false alert could easily get someone killed someday. The Long Beach Police Department's new policy does not limit what type of cases criminal facial recognition can be used for. That makes this a tool of mass incarceration. Um, Detroit Police Department had to get rid of their, their last policy after it led to that. Thank you. Our next speaker, Tessa Cole, please unmute and begin speaking. Hi, right, can you hear me? Yes, we can, please begin. Hi, um, I'm, yeah, I'm really concerned about the LBPD's use of facial recognition, particularly the use policy they've recently put forward. Um, like the previous speaker, I'd really hope there'd be an opportunity for us to comment on the presentation itself, uh, but I'll try to guess at what, what's most relevant. Um, so Long Beach PD has been using facial recognition for years. It's dramatically increased their usage in the past year, uh, but the policy they've put forward has huge holes in it. Um, especially with regards to equity and civil rights. Uh, in fact, some of the holes in their policies are issues that other departments were already forced to fix after they led directly to serious incidents of discrimination. Um, at a time when even some of the companies that make these technologies are warning about the dangers of using this in policing, this is really baffling. Uh, in the case of LBPD, the policy they drafted was even more lax than the one that comes with the software. They literally took the recommendation from the software vendor itself, which we can already assume to be biased in favor of maximum usage and chose to walk that back even further. That's really concerning. I'm sure they're gonna insist that we shouldn't worry because the facial recognition is only used to identify possible suspects 
but not used as evidence for prosecution. But there is a huge body of research showing that this type of usage is still massively discriminatory. This was exactly the situation with other departments, including Detroit PD and many other cities like the previous speaker mentioned. There's not enough time here to list all the specific best practices this policy is missing, but they're outlined in the letter sent to this committee from Czech LBPD. I don't expect this council or even LBPD to be experts in the best practices of this technology because there's a lot of technical details. But unless we want to be the next headline, we want we need an independent and transparent process for facial recognition use policy policy that does reach out to independent experts and takes into account actual best practices and aligns with our framework for reconciliation. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Franklin Sims. Please unmute and begin speaking. Franklin Sims, please unmute and begin speaking if you're on the line. Our next speaker is Jamilet Ochoa. Please unmute yourself and begin speaking. Good evening. My name is Jamila and I am a community organizer with the Long Beach Immigrants Rights Coalition. First, let me share that the so-called joke about having this meeting being language access was offensive. I called this morning for interpretation due to the 24 hour in advance notice and that wasn't an option. Do not make jokes like that when there are people who do not speak English that are currently being excluded. This is not funny. This is the reality due to the lack of funding for programs like the language access. Now to the topic of this meeting. I have, been I have been following the city council meetings along with other committee presentations and I keep seeing the repeated dismissal of community input when it comes to surveillance technologies. LBPD has used financial, uh, facial recognition for over a decade, mainly through participation in the LA County Regional Identification System. Facial recognition software is notoriously racist and has prone to abuse. Yet local and federal law enforcement agencies, including ICE, have used the technology on images of protests and demonstrators following the killing of George Floyd. If we really wanna talk about safety, listen to the communities that are most impacted by these technologies, listen to the following demands and adopt them now. As part of the ultimate goal of defunding the Long Beach Police Department, we demand that that there is an end to the police department funding with these invasive technologies that create mass surveillance and drain money from our city. The city, um, we are demanding that there is an end to the use of automatic license plate readers, terminate the contract with uh, International General Dynamics and Vigilant Solutions, and cell phone surveillance, terminate the Stingray contract with Harris Corporation and cell phone hacking contract with Celebrite, prohibit any government use of ALPR, cell phone surveillance, or facial recognition to the technology, whether it's in the form of a trial, contract, or purchase of third-party data, remove the Long Beach Police Department from participating in LASIRS, prohibit direct data sharing with federal immigration authorities, and prohibit direct data sharing with federal and local authorities and private companies that collaborate with federal immigration authorities and all other civilian surveillance programs prohibit future purchases or use of surveillance technologies and make public of all records of surveillance use. It has been difficult to find all this data and it is intentional. We are aware that these technologies are not at all helpful and instead putting our communities more in danger. Thank you. That, our next speaker, Shailen Craig. Hi, my name is Shailen Craig. Uh, I'm a resident of District 2 here in Long Beach. Um, I want to start off by saying that I want to voice my support for all of the demands that Jami Lett just, um, just stated. Um, I'm here to also just Excuse me, Ms. Say Craig? There yes. seems to be an alarm going off on your phone. It's not me. No. Can you hear me okay? We, we can hear you now. Okay. Yes. 
Uh, I'm just going to keep going. Uh, I'm here to say that I'm deeply disturbed by the expansion of surveillance technologies in our city um, and the millions and millions of dollars that have been invested in these various technologies, even just in the last year. And my feelings are not simply from a desire for personal privacy, which also is valid, but from what we know these technologies like facial recognition are capable of and their impact on targeting, incarcerating, and deporting our loved ones. And even more alarmingly, what we don't know. It's taken years to uncover some of this insidious nature of racist algorithms, and the public still does not truly know exactly how and to what extent these technologies are being used. What we do know is clear. Data is constantly being produced, gathered, and sold at the expense of our freedoms. We know that the company that developed LACRIS deployed a similar platform with the same underlying algorithms in Detroit where Robert Williams was wrongfully arrested by police. We know this platform is faulty at best, misidentifying individuals and leading to prosecution of innocent black men. Safeguards, transparency, and oversight are largely non-existent. We should remove LBPD from participation in all sur civilian surveillance programs and make public all records of surveillance in use. Thank you. Our next speaker, Tina True, please unmute. And when you begin speaking, we'll start your time. Hi, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Thank you. Good afternoon. My name is Tina, and I'm a teacher and concerned community member as well. Um, I'd like to echo the previous speaker and um, Gemilette. I'm speaking today because I believe that facial recognition software is inherently racist and harms people. The LBPD and federal law enforcement agencies, including ICE, have used this technology on images of protests and demonstrations um, following the killing of George Floyd. These images are used to harm working class and poor communities. Um, as a teacher, they hurt young people and students, which is what I'm mostly concerned about. Last year, uh, Detroit police uh, arrested Robert Williams, a black man, in his driveway in front of his family. He was shown a photo of someone else, and after telling the officer it wasn't him, he says the officer replied, the computer says it's you okay this is what we mean when we say these technologies are prone to abuse and exacerbate racial biases and profiling okay so instead of providing this continued funding uh, we urge the city council to end its use of surveillance technology we need to adopt the people's budget that gives funding to housing we're in a housing crisis language access free legal representation, youth programs, senior programs, and so much more. We could be using this money for so much more. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Fabio Mello. If you're on the line, please unmute and begin speaking. Fabio Mello, please press star six. Our next speaker, Victor Buzzi, please press star six and begin speaking. Hello, can y'all hear me? Yes, we can hear you. All right, cool. I want to second Jim Yolette's call for language access. Since COVID, these meetings online are not allowing non-English speakers to access democracy in Long Beach. That's just wrong. I'm representing myself and the Democratic Socialists of Long Beach. Uh, all right, there was a whole lot of cameras out there. Police Chief Robert Luna said that at a press conference on June 1st after the protest began last year. <clears throat> We have your face and we're coming after you and we're going to arrest you. That's what Luna said. Robert Luna said that, right? A bit about the LBPD and the CPCC. Uh, incidents occurring between 2015 and 2019, the LBPD was sued 39 times with the city paying out almost $9 million in additional expenses. Half of them between 250 and 2 million, as well as an additional 
five million as a court uh, court ruling in the plaintiff's favor. 2011 to 2012, <clears throat> while Garcia was serving as the first district council member, the CPCC investigated 251 allegations, but only sustained two. CPCC seems to be a sham, documented sham, right? So now back to facial recognition. Researchers in MIT and Microsoft found that leading facial recognition software had trouble identifying women and people of color. Identifying women and people of color. 35% of the time. But when it came to white people, white men, that was correct. So, yo, this system has baked into it racism, baked into it. The federal government released its own study on the subject that had similar findings to MIT and Microsoft, right? And then there's clear view AI. And this is some of the practices that other police departments have been using. The LBPD barred its employees from using commercial facial recognition software for any purposes after it discovered some officers had used a Clearview AI system without permission. So to sum it up, LBPD is untrustworthy. They're not trustworthy to use any sort of facial recognition software. And again, I wish I had a chance to watch the presentation before I had commented. From 2015 to 2018, the CPCC investigated 487 separate allegations of improper force. And what happened? And what happened? What happened? Most of them got, only three of them were sustained and most of them overruled by the city manager, Pat West. Like we can't trust these people. There is no oversight. There is no oversight. We need to defund LBPD and pass the people's budget. Thank you. Our next speaker is Stephanie Fawaz. Please unmute yourself and please begin. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. All right, uh, thank you, council members. Uh, I would like to echo the previous public comments concern about speaking before the LBPD's presentation on their use of facial recognition technology. Uh, I had hoped to better understand LBPD's publicly shared plan and have the opportunity to respond directly to it uh, but as is, I think my comments will probably still be relevant, so I will give them as planned. Uh, there are well-documented flaws and biases inherent in facial recognition algorithms, and the LBBT, or LBBD has failed to share any plans to enact measures and policies that would combat these issues with their use of facial recognition. Uh, I'd like to provide numerical data to support uh, the previous public comments. In December of 2019, the National Institute of Standards and Technology released a study documenting the false identification and verification rates of facial recognition algorithms compared across demographics, including race, gender, age, and more. Uh, I found it very comprehensive, but for the purposes of this discussion, I'd like to share that the study found that women are misidentified up to five times as often as men. Across race, the discrepancy is much starker. Black people and East Asian people have a false positive verification rate orders of magnitude greater than that of white people. Asian women were 10 times as likely to be misidentified than white men. Black women were 25 times as likely to be misidentified than white men. Domestically, the highest false positive rate appeared in Native American women who are up to 68 times more likely to draw a false positive than white men. I'd like to put this into perspective. When considering Long Beach's racial demographics in 2020, the white population outnumbered the black population four to one. But assuming the false positive rates found by the NIST are true, for every false positive of a white man, you could expect to see up to four false positives for black women. The white population outnumbers the Native American population almost 50 to one, but for every false positive of a white man, you could expect to see an equal number of false positives amongst Native American women. Given that Long Beach's rates of poverty are highest amongst Black and Native populations, this is an unacceptable outcome. In March of this year, LB Chief of Police Robert Luna stated plainly in the Special Order Memorandum that, quote, the Long Beach Police Department may elect to integrate the use of facial recognition technology with its public safety video surveillance. Chief Luna, this is the, a deplorable thing to leave available to you. California passed AB 1215 because biometric surveillance technologies like facial recognition are a significant threat to the civil liberties of the residents of Long Beach. To allow the LBBT to move forward as planned with their use of facial recognition would mean that the mistaken targeting of Long Beach's most vulnerable populations is not just probable, but inevitable. I implore the Public Safety Committee to support the creation of an independent commission to provide oversight to these practices by the LBBT. I yield the rest of my time. 
Our next speaker is Lilia Ocampo. Please unmute and begin. Lilia Ocampo, if you're on the line, please begin. Our next speaker is Sarah Weefold. Please unmute and begin. Hi, thank you for the opportunity to address this group. Um, I also uh, echo previous commenters uh, that it's difficult to be able to provide comment on a presentation when we are not able to view that presentation before providing comment. Um, I would ask that in the future, uh, the presentation be given first before comment. Um, so many of the uh, Many of the things that I would cover are already mentioned in the letter from Czech LB, uh, LBPD that is attached to the agenda item for, for, for this particular topic. Um, I am deeply troubled after reading the policy um, that LBPD uh, currently has around the use of facial recognition software uh, because it completely fails to consider the various ways in which the technology can be mishandled, misused, and even outright abused. Um, I mean, the way that facial recognition technology works is that it, it's not just sort of like reading a photo and magically coming up with matches. It's reading a photo and comparing it to train data from elsewhere that it has been trained on. And the libraries of information that this technology has been trained on are usually not people of color. They're usually not women. And, and as you know, previous commenters have already pointed out, this is the source of the well-documented and well-known issue of racist results that end up coming back. So if our goal is to have a less racist policing policy being enacted citywide, um, I'm struggling to understand why the policy as written contains so many holes. Um, any use of new technology like this needs to have a very complete imagining of the various ways in which it can be misused, badly applied, and even maliciously used to harass and intimidate. Because even if this technology is not being used in prosecutions, it being used to identify suspects and thereby, you know, impacting someone's ability to enjoy their liberty, um, that even if it's not resulting directly in a conviction, that is that is a bridge too far. Um, the policy as written makes very generalized statements on how facial recognition may, may be used, and it creates vast opportunities for abuse. Specifically, there is a provision in it saying that the LBPD reserves the right to be able to use it in live video contexts. Most software providers, I would dare say pretty much all of them, have said at this point that the technology does not yet support being able to identify people accurately in a live setting. Uh, so it's very troubling to me that the, this right is being reserved when even the people who are creating this technology say don't do it. So all of this together makes me really question the ability at this point of LBPD to responsibly use the software in the course of investigations. Thank you. Um, that concludes public comment. Thank you. Um, Chair, Chair Sorrow, I'm sorry to interrupt. Can I just say something before we go to the presentation? Sure. Um, I just wanted to apologize about the language access comment that I made at the beginning of the meeting. I, I sincerely apologize to everybody there. We were told that we couldn't be heard in the chamber, so we all started to do our audio um, test in our native languages and i was trying to convey that we're a very diverse group and so i made a comment about us having language access but of course unless you were trying to count to 10 in farsi um, that wasn't really an interpretation of anything that was happening at the meeting so i apologize to that for that and, and that sincerely was not the intent i, I thought i was communicating with uh, councilman Roberto and um, Chair Saro regarding the fact that we were all using different languages to do our testing. Um, so I apologize. I do have a concern, and maybe this is for the city clerk. If somebody goes to council chambers 
are the council chambers open right now? If they needed an interpreter, would there be an interpreter available to them? So, Vice Chair, this meeting was advised as a virtual meeting, so we do not have the chambers open to the public at this time. Okay, so, I mean, I think that is an issue. If people request an interpreter for a meeting, we should be able to provide a way for them to have an interpreter. So, I don't even know if we have a form online or if they call, if we can help them, because I think that is a really important issue, because unless you were trying to count to 10 in Farsi, my interpretation skills weren't going to be of any service to anyone. Um, and they should be able to have an interpreter present to help them, whether it's we can connect somebody at the city with them that can help interpret. But I think if we can work towards a mechanism for virtual meetings for them to have access, especially if the state bill passes and we have telephonic um, input, I think it's very important that language access be something that we consider. So thank you, Chair Sara. I just wanted to make sure I said that. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Vice um, Chair Price, for addressing that um, and, and addressing the language access issue for our all our meetings. Uh, before I go to um, the presentation, I just wanted to make sure to recap that, you know, in the previous public safety committee meeting, I shared that I would like us to have a, a, a fuller discussion on this item around facial recognition and give LPD a chance to talk a little bit more about its use, um, its privacy consideration and best practices associated with it. So um, I'd like to have Assistant Chief uh, Wally Habish to provide a presentation on this item. Thank you, Madam Chair. And let me try to share my screen here. And can you see that okay? Great. Yes. So thank you, Madam Chair and committee members. Today I'll be providing this presentation on the facial recognition component of the Los Angeles County Regional Identification System, LACRIS. So based on some of the, the committee discussion and direction from our last public safety meeting, I wanted to start today's presentation with an overview of our core values, which you see up here. Ethics. This is about policing in a constitutional manner, serving everyone in our community fairly and, and equally. Intelligence. This is policing in a manner that promotes creativity and innovation, utilizing best practices, along with tools and technology to keep our community safe. Similar to what, what is outlined in Pillar 3 from President Obama's final task force report on 21st century policing. And respect. Everyone matters and all people shall be treated with dignity and respect. We must take the time to listen and give people a voice. These values should be at the core of the service we provide in all areas of policing, including our use of lacrosse. And by the way, you can find a, a more de detailed graphic of these values on our website. So how do we use lacrosse? I'll start by touching on how we don't use lacrosse. Lacrosse is not a platform that we utilize to predict behavior like some predictive policing software solutions. Lacrosse is not used for racial profiling of anyone. Racial profiling is not only unethical, but against department policy. And LACRIS is not used for mass surveillance for demonstrations where non-criminal activity is occurring. So how do we use LACRIS? Only photographs that we, the only photographs we place into the LACRIS database are those associated with a criminal investigation. A LACRIS search is done based on reasonable suspicion of a crime and not to ra randomly identify people. However, there are caveats to that, such as incidents involving unidentified deceased individuals. As we all know, on May 31st, several businesses in our city were victimized due to criminal behavior. I wanted to show an example of the LACRIS workflow and how it assisted in our investigations at this time. This first example shows still shots of security video from a local convenience store. In the video, a subject is observed illegally entering the closed business and leaving with two boxes of merchandise, including clothing and liquor. Detectives investigating this crime were able to obtain a still image of the subject's face from, from security video. As you can see here, the image was then placed into the LACRIS booking photo database and a possible candidate was provided as an investigative lead. Follow-up investigation was conducted to further corroborate the LACRIS information and develop a case for filing consideration. In this particular case, Detectives completed their investigation and presented it to the district attorney who charged the subject with one count of looting. 
The second example involves another individual that participated in criminal behavior on May 31st. The security video you see here shows images of this individual at three separate locations in the city of Long Beach. The first security video shows the subject illegal entering a local clothing store and exiting the vandalized location with numerous closing items. Number two, the second video captures what appears to be the same individual vandalizing and looting a local cell phone store. The individual not only damaged property, but also stole two cash registers and numerous cell phones, totaling over $150,000 in loss. And the third location shows the individual as he hit a local jewelry store. At this location, the subject was able to steal over a thousand pieces of jewelry worth more than $180,000. I just want to briefly mention that this individual also burglarized other businesses on this day, including a local medical pharmacy, where he took over $100,000 worth of various drugs, three computers, and over $2,000 in cash. Close up of this individual shows a very distinct tattoo on his face and arm. An image was then taken from the security video after it was thoroughly reviewed by detectives. And you can see that in the bottom uh, half of the screen here. Again, the image was placed into the LACRA system uh, booking photo database to find a possible candidate, which detectives then conducted further investigation on to corroborate a possible match. The case was completed and presented to the district attorney who filed seven felony burglary charges against the suspect. As a reminder, a candidate matched through the use of LACRIS is only a portion of a fair and thorough investigation, and LACRIS information must be corroborated through other investigative action. This can be a vehicle description from a crime scene, it can be a video broadcast by traditional media outlets, or oftentimes suspects place images and videos on open source public social media platforms. We want all of our investigations to remain fair and just, and I just want to reiterate, LACRIS is just a piece of the puzzle, not the complete product. So I've shared some examples, but I also wanted to highlight that after the looting and vandalism that happened on May 31st, many of our employees were taken out of their regular assignments and placed on a looting task force. These employees worked around the clock, reviewing evidence and following up on investigative leads. They viewed thousands of hours of security video. And what you see here is a small sampling of the results of their hard work and commitment to solving many of the cases associated with the crimes that took place that day. This was really impressive work by our sworn and professional staff. So what guides the use of our systems? And more specifically, how are we evaluating our use of LACRIS to ensure the rights of all people? It, begin, it begins with several department policies that supplement our core values and the oath that we take when we're sworn in as police officers. You can see some of our policies here. First, general responsibilities and conduct toward the public. In these policies, employees are directed to treat all persons equally and with fairness, regardless of race, ethnicity, sexual orientation, or social status. Employees are directed to remain impartial and reminded that all citizens are guaranteed equal protection under the law. Second, fair and bias-free policing. This policy strictly prohibits bias-based policing and racial profiling during the enforcement of laws or any other service we provide. This policy also spells out supervisory responsibilities to ensure compliance and oversight are taking place, as well as steps to be taken should a violation occur. And our special order on facial recognition technology. This special order mandates that any use of facial recognition technology does not violate the privacy rights of anyone and calls out amendments to the U.S. Constitution pertaining to the protection of privacy, specifically the First, Fourth, and Fourteenth Amendments. When we evaluate our practices or processes, like in the case of LACRIS, we have three areas of consideration. Best practices. Under best practices, we look at what are other law enforcement agencies in our region doing to solve crimes? What tools are effective and what tools present challenges? In the case of LACRIS, 64 agencies in our region are currently using this system. We have active, active involvement in professional organizations such as the Major Cities Chiefs Association and Los Angeles County Police Chiefs Associ Association. Many robust discussions on the current state and future of policing take place with representatives from throughout the country and the county. An academic think tank such as the Police Executive Research Forum or PERP, where issues related to policing are studied and discussed for best practice recommendations to law enforcement leaders. The next area is legal mandates. 
Our use of systems such as LACRIS must be consistent with local, state, and federal law. For example, California Assembly Bill 1215 placed a moratorium on the use of body-worn camera with facial recognition technology. Another example is the Long Beach Values Act, which prohibits us from participating in civil immigration issues. This is further supported through our facial recognition technology special order. And the third area is partnerships. Much of our success is dependent on partnerships. Our community advisory group provides an external review of policy creation and revision. Our policy review committee and labor organizations provide valuable input for consideration on how tools and practices might impact employee efficiency and wellness. And city departments. The partnership with our policymakers and city departments really provides guidance and assistance on how we can best move forward in providing service to our community. Our partners in the Office of Equity that are working extremely close with our Office of Constitutional Policing are helping us address policy and practice while ensuring we are engaged in meeting the goals set forth in the city's framework for reconciliation, including goal number three, which addresses facial recognition technology. LACRIS, like many other systems, must be managed and evaluated on a regular basis to ensure we are providing the highest level of star communities. Well, thank you. This concludes my presentation and I'm free to answer any questions you may like. Unfortunately, my closing slide's not working here. Oh, okay. So. <laughs> um, thank you, Assistant Chief Habish, for that presentation. I appreciate you coming back on uh, my request for how it works, what is the policies used as well as best practices to guide it. Um, I would like to open um, this to my colleagues, uh, Vice Chair Price or Council Member Uranga, for comments or questions before I provide mine. Uh, sure, just real, real briefly, Councilwoman or Chair Sorrow, uh, the one question I had is, what's the, um, what's the timeline that LVPD is anticipating for um, the implementation of this software, if at all? I, I'm sorry, uh, Member Price or Vice Vice Chair Price. I, I'm so, I don't quite understand the question. The, what's what's the status of the software right now and what's the what's the timeline for its implementation are you speaking of the lacquer system yes so the lacquer the, there's that is already happening the lacquer system is something we've been participating in for years so that is the la county database the booking photo database so um, there's no new software or changes to software that are that are happening to to help us uh, utilize the system that's direct access through the county. Okay, so the, it's 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 the same exact thing that we've been utilizing. Yes, ma'am. Okay, all right. I didn't realize it was the same thing. Thank you. Yes, this isn't a new or a different software platform that that we are onboarding. Oh, I see. Okay, thank you. I appreciate that clarification. Yes, ma'am. Is there any, did you have any other question, Vice Chair? I don't, not right now, thank you. Okay. Council Member Uranga. Uh, thank you, Chair. <clears throat> the one thing that, that uh, I guess I would like to have seen in this presentation is uh, the policies of, on the use of LACRIS. I mean, uh, there's, I know that there's concern out in the community about it, maybe it's overuse in situations where there might be uh, uh, a caravan or a, a protest and a uh, not, maybe not a protest and we are gathering at the park uh, certain uh, well-known headquarters of organizations and having this uh, technology used to identify people of interest is there a, is, are there policies on uh, on uses of, of the uh, of the system Yes, Member Oranga, the, the situations that you just described are, are not criminal. Uh, demonstrations and political meetings are not criminal, so we would not be using the LACRA system uh, uh, to obtain security video of something that doesn't have a criminal component or a criminal nexus. So uh, our policies are, are posted online, including the facial recognition policy. I believe I, I heard someone earlier comment that it was not, so I'll have to double, double back and check on that. But um, 
Yeah, that those those rights are protected through the US Constitution and we would not uh, utilize any security footage um, uh, for someone who is just exercising their First Amendment rights. Okay, so let's say if there was a demonstration on a park, uh, starts off peaceful, but somehow turns, uh, takes a left turn and goes violent. Would the, would the lacquer system be uh, in use at that point to identify people? So it could be, depending on what digital evidence the uh, the officer or the detective had. So say there was a, a, um, a peaceful demonstration at a park and somebody was shot. If we were provided cell phone video or security video and the detective was able to secure a, an image that could be placed into the lacquer system, it could help provide a, uh, an investigative lead that would need to be further corroborated and maybe point the detective in the right direction. Um, but that lead would need to be um, uh, used in conjunction with other other tools and other investigative techniques, as I mentioned in the presentation. There's a, there's a variety of them um, before uh, they could present that case to the district attorney. So um, again, it would just be one small piece of a thorough and fair investigation. But uh, if, if that evidence was available, the detective could certainly evaluate it and determine whether or not they could uh, use the LACRA system to develop an investigative lead. And to follow up on uh, Councilmember Price's, Vice Chair Price's uh, comment about the, the system itself, this is a system that basically has been used for a number of years, correct? Yes, sir. So it, 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 there's nothing new to the system at this point in, in, in the use of the department? No, the, the administrators are, are the L, is LA County Lacras. They, they're the administrators of the system. They have a developed policy that's integrated into their training po protocol. And that, that policy, if you're an agency that participates in the Lacras program, that policy sits on top of uh, uh, any use of the Lacras system that your agency would have, in addition to our special order that, that is out now. Okay, so Long Beach is part of a, has an agreement with LA County to use this system as a as a an investigative tool. Yes, Member Garinga. So I had chair. Thank you. Uh, so I want to. I do have a few questions I want to follow up. And when you talk about periodic review of the LBPD's use of the LACRA system, what does periodic mean? Is that on a quarterly basis or a biannual basis that it gets reviewed? Thank you, uh, Chair Saro. So there, there's there's a few different layers to the review. They, the review can happen by the LACRIS administrators. It can happen by the Department of Justice or internally here in the uh, Police Department, an LBPD review. Now their review schedule, I don't have in front of me, but um, our internal review is going to, we, we do not have a schedule yet for internal review of that, but our policy does mandate that the supervisor overseeing the use of that system does ensure that it's being used uh, appropriately and take steps if it is not. So there are reviews that happen on three different um, from three different entities, uh, but we don't have a, a fixed review uh, schedule set in place yet. And then I'd like to follow to see if, if there will be um, something more regularly, just so then, you know, there's a sense that um, while it's reviewed by three different will there be a schedule because i believe that um, it gets a better sense on just making sure there's a timeline with it yes a really good question right now our uh, audit is in development and so we should have a uh, a scheduled review coming up that i can provide to the committee um, also the i believe the doj review um, happened at the end of june 2021 so um, a few different reviews but we are developing our audit uh, as we speak Okay, thank you. I have a few more questions around um, the use of this LACRA system is, does it have, can it potentially be used for mass surveillance um, in the city? And if it does, what process would it be taken? For example, if it was added to security cameras, um, not body cameras, but security cameras. Yeah, so the, the LACRA system is not a city system. So it would be, to, I, I can't speak to how other agencies would use it or how the administrators would, would utilize it. If you think of it as just a bucket of information, 
that's a silo from from the city that we are not there's there's also fingerprint identification and other other uh, investigative tools that are within the LACRA system. So it, it's not something that that we would be able to embed within our own systems and uh, and use to randomly identify people. We have to use our own security footage or uh, digital evidence uh, and then submit that into that bucket and see if there's a possible candidate match. Then take that back and continue our investigation. So embedding the LACRA system, uh, again, I'm, I'm not, uh, expert technology person, but embedding the LACRA system into standalone uh, security cameras, I don't think is possible. And it, and we certainly couldn't do it at Long Beach because it's not our system. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And so would you say then that currently we don't, do we have any technology that is doing mass surveillance of the public at this moment that LBPD is doing? We don't conduct mass surveillance of, of the community. Okay, and um, the other question I had too is: Do 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 ICE would is information from this LACRA system shared with ICE or the data that is collected? Not our information. So if if ICE has access to LACRA, that would be a separate um, uh, negotiation between or a separate uh, contract between ICE and LACRA. For us, our our policy actually says that anybody that obtains or utilizes um, our information uh, needs to comply with our policy. And our policy supports the Long Beach Values Act and the California Values Act, and we do not participate in immigration, uh, civil immigration enforcement. Okay. Thank you so much. I, I just have one more question. It's, and it's, this, it's relating to, you know, surveillance cameras in the city. Of all of the, is that something LBPD is overseas as far as the surveillance camera that we have, um, you know, everywhere in, the, you know, at least in the public spaces, like such as our parks or or other public spaces, who, who manages those surveillance camera? Yes, uh, Madam Chair, the, the security cameras for the city are um, managed through the Department of Technology and Innovation. And so the uh, we work in conjunction with the uh, DTI. Um, but those are city cameras um, tied to a city system. So when would you have access to these uh, footage from the city cameras? When would you generally access them? We could access them if we needed them in the furtherance of an investigation to um, uh, investigate a crime similar to um, what happened a few weeks ago at uh, Martin Luther King Park. Uh, mm -hmm. That would be a scenario in which we would want to access the city cameras to determine whether or not we could identify the suspects responsible for that crime. Um, uh, we would use them for a large scale event where we determined there would be some type of criminal activity that was going to take place. But uh, those are, are used in conjunction with the standards set forth by the Department of Technology and Innovation and the city. So anytime there's a, a technology acquisition or use of camera or, or software platform, uh, the city um, uh, mandates that we submit a technology service request that goes through our chain of command. It goes to the city attorney's office and it's uh, eventually signed off by the city manager's office. Thank you so, so much, Assistant Chief Habish, for answering all my questions. I. I want to go back to my colleagues if there's any further questions before uh, we vote on this item. I have nothing further. Thank you. Council Member Uranga, Vice Chair Price. Um, the only other question I would have is how many agencies within LA County use the system? If you know. Yeah, yeah I do, Vice Chair. It would be 64 agencies as of uh, late use the LACRA system within our region. And do we happen to know out of how many, how many active um, law enforcement agencies do we have in that jurisdiction? I do not. I'm sorry. Okay. No. no problem. Okay. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you, Vice Chair. So, you know, uh, again, you know, I, I, um, I want to share that technology working um, and using new technology um, for the right reasons is going to always continue to be important. Um, for this committee and for us to have this healthy discussion about uh, what it means and how it's used and how it impacts um, our residents. So I hope that this discussion also demonstrates our commitment to the framework for reconciliation around 
uh, discussing the practice of facial recognition, recognition technology um, and their impact on the community. And I, I, I look forward into also um, ensuring that um, there is a process for us to have this dialogue here and want to thank the community for voicing their concerns and question and that it's important we work together to figure out what's the best way um, to safeguard the right of our community members, but meanwhile using the best technology to ensure that we are addressing and fighting crime. Um, so with that, um, please uh, vote. Vote committee members. Let's take a vote. Council Member Yuranga. Aye. Vice Chair Price. Aye. Chair Saro. Aye. Motion carries. Thank you. And um, do we have any general public comments? Chair, we did not have anybody sign up to general public comment. Okay. I do want to make sure the public do know that there's a chance for general public comment in the very end. Um, so if, if that if people, if the public was not aware about that. So uh, with that said, um, are there any more comments from the committee member before I adjourn our meeting? Thank you. So, Daddy, I would like to uh, make a comment since uh, my uh, public comment to agenda item number three was not read aloud. I'm sorry, we did just discuss agenda item number three, but. Yeah, so uh, I just want to let the group know because I wrote it in the chat that I submitted a public comment via email. Okay. And I put instructions to have my comment read aloud and it was not. And so I asked and I also and it wasn't on, um, on the website as an attachment. And so I also requested to speak on agenda item number three, but it has passed. So I just want to let you guys know that my, I did not have the opportunity to speak on agenda item number three nor was my written public comment read aloud. Um, well, we, we do have it and we will review it. I did, you know, am just now seeing all of the comments at this moment um, and didn't get the memo that it was requested to be read live. Um, but I do appreciate you taking the time to writing it and we'll make sure we review it. Um, so thank you very much. And, um, and I, at this moment, declare the meeting adjourned.